The Spinoff Podcast Network. Kia ora, I'm Duncan Grieve, founder of The Spinoff. You can help us keep all of The Spinoff's award-winning journalism free for everybody by becoming a member today at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. No mai hoki mai ki ada fold imihine ko Duncan Grieve toku ingoa. My guest today is Matt Bain, who is the marketing and data director for Spark. This continues a series which I've been kind of picking up on and off for the last six months or so, just wanting to really understand what is driving the advertising side of media. The reason being that you know, it's still by far the biggest driver of what we get to see on our screens in New Zealand. And so the the thinking that underlies that is actually incredibly important. And I don't think it's something that we in the sort of content side of media um, think about enough. And so uh, my guest today, uh, Matt Bain, is someone who has one of, if not the biggest budget in the country. Um, Spark is one of our largest corporates. It has, in terms of people who can really make scale things happen in, in this industry, he's one of, if not the very top of the tree, has been with Spark for six years. And so he yeah, had a little bit of time under uh, Simon Muta, but has largely worked under uh, Jolly Hodson. And um, there's just a there's just not many people who have the kind of influence that 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 he does. Um, a bit about him. Before Spark, he spent 20 years um, working in Europe uh, for the agency Aqua, which worked across sort of brand data and and sort of innovation for a, a whole bunch of blue chip clients, the likes of of Nike, Heineken, Rolls Royce. Uh, EA Sports. Um, so we talk a bit about that background, but the, the sort of the meat of the conversation is really about a kind of a modern philosophy of um, marketing and, you know, what the likes of Spark Sports and Lightbox meant to to Spark and why they ultimately exited those businesses. Uh, looking at the relationships with Netflix and Spotify, why they have moved so strongly away from the sort of TVC um, as the heart of what they do from a marketing perspective and why it's much more for Spark about taking an event or a product and kind of amplifying from that. Um, and then we dwell quite a lot on Spark Game Arena Live, which is this big event. I talked about it a couple of weeks ago. It had a budget, which as as Matt said, was comparable to, to a TVC. TVC budget for the likes of Spark is about as big as budgets come. So that tells you the, that that level of production I observed at the event was was really something. And he sort of explains why that that kind of concept has been able to replace the, the TVC in the sort of Spark marketing calendar in, in some respects. Um, uh, and about what worked and, and what maybe didn't about that event. And there's a, a sort of a level of reflection and candor that, that he expresses here, which I, you know, I really appreciated and I don't think you will always see from people in jobs like his. So uh, this is Matt Bain, the Marketing and Data Director of Spark on the fold. Tenakwe Matt, thanks for coming on the fold. Hey, great to be here. Um, I wonder if you could tell me ab about your background prior to starting at Spark. Like you had 20 years in Europe working on some pretty huge brands. Yeah, yeah. So um, a bit of an interesting journey. Started um, as a quant guy, so building predictive quant models back in the day. Um, could you unpack that for, for an audience yeah, so, that might, might not be um, familiar? Back in the dot-com boom, there were a lot of big brands interested in what was the digital mean for them. So I was taking large data sets of what people said they did versus what they did and then predicting what were the key drivers of things like e-commerce adoption. So, you know, everyone said, well, you know, people are scared of putting their credit cards online. If you asked them, they said they were. And then no one 
displayed that behavior for example right? <laughs> stated versus so, revealed yeah, preferences kind of thing, right so i was i was doing that i was consulting with the european union uh, when i first got to europe and then started working at msc saatchi which was in the kind of e-commerce boom days doing due diligence on business plans for them um, for some of their clients then got into advertising and eventually ended up at a company called akqa where i was for 13 years before coming here and that's where i got to work on a lot of the big global brands so what one of the brand the, those brands was Nike, which has you know kind of a, a a peerless reputation in terms of brand building and the sort of the, the way that it expresses that across multiple um, sort of touch points. It's also a brand which has had a pretty tough couple of years. I assume you've sort of kept in touch with that. Um, do you, you know, in part because of a real emphasis on DTC and performance and maybe sacrificing some of that amazing world building that they did in brand, um, I just wondered if you could sort of talk about your time with Nike and maybe give a bit of a, a view on, you know, how they've gone in the past couple of years and, and uh, you know, some of that, uh, the changes that have been made to, to the way they've marketed in recent years. Yeah, so they were a client of mine for 13 years. Um, and quite early in the time I was working with them, I launched with them Nike Plus uh, globally. So that was a, I don't know, pre kind of smartphone almost where you had a dongle which you attached to your iPod, remember, and you had a pedometer that went in your Nike shoe. Yeah. And for the first time you could see how far and fast you ran. Um, and that was a really interesting experience for me because the first time I'd been involved with a brand that said, we value engagement over, you know, reach and frequency tarps. And what I saw was that, as, that once they got a critical mass of runners engaged, and this was built around a running audience because they realized they had a credibility gap in the running area. They were seen as a fashionable dance shoe, but not necessarily a credible running shoe. Mm. What I saw was the power of engagement transferring to market share quite quickly, right, through a small number of very uh, well-respected runners I guess, through social, ex demonstrating that they were using this product and they were running with Nike. So <clears throat> for me, that was that was formative and I still take a lot of that thinking today. I think they, they pioneered the use of digital to engage large audiences as a brand. Um, but through that time, they were also doing a lot of, you know, quite provocative, performance-oriented, culturally connected, above-the-line work and, and creative work and, and advertising. And I think what 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 we've seen happen with them now, and again, I'm not as close, not working with them, but as you say, they've, they've gone strongly into D2C, they've lost some of their uh, wholesale retailers. Mm. Um, so they've lost some, some distribution, um, and maybe they've come off the boil in terms of innovation and new product to market. They've always been really strong on what's next, focus on the customer, you know, what can make someone, you know, run faster, jump higher. And it feels like they've lost that story a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, right? Because it feels like they're a microcosm of a bigger debate that's happening in marketing about how you uh, balance the the sort of the kind of stuff that's right next to the transaction versus kind of um, precipitating future transactions, getting a brand to really kind of live rent free in someone's mind. Um, I just wondered if. So when you when you returned to New Zealand, what was it about you know moving to that client side with Spark that you found compelling? In my career to date, I'd I'd been on the kind of the data quant side. I'd built with clients digital ecosystems, so a lot of technology, web app stuff, and and so I had a, a foot in both camps of technology and data, but also design and creativity. And the opportunity at Spark was to have a role which spanned those areas. So I'm responsible for brand and marketing and our data and automation capabilities at Spark. So the ability to go, right, we can, here's a role that allows you to, to take all that experience, have control of those, over those domains and how they show up for customers was, was one of the key reasons. And yeah, have you found that those things marry together well in a company like Spark? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, for the last four years, we've focused really heavily on how do we use data and technology to serve Spark customers better, right? And so you talk about brand versus kind of selling focus. We have those as very separate teams, budgets and streams of work at Spark. So the lower funnel, how do we retain customers, acquire new customers, make sure our customers are happy? That's um, by and large driven by AI now, 
because we can use the understanding of our customers to understand what's the next best thing for them. And whether it be a service message or a thank you message or you know, if we think someone's going to churn making them an offer or upselling someone, that's largely automated. And, and separate metrics from things that we do at, at a brand level. So at a brand level, this, to your point, it's all about how do people feel about us, right? And and do they feel like Spark's the kind of brand that they want to be associated with? Lower funnel, that's I'm in market now for a iPhone. Now, at any given month in telco, only a couple of percent of the total market will be in market, right? Because you only buy a phone every three or four years. So that lower funnel marketing has to be really well targeted because there's only a tiny proportion of people are actually in market, which which makes the brand work really important, right? Because that's mm. how you that's how you you keep people who aren't in market uh, attached to what you're doing and what you stand for. It's it's really interesting you to hear you say that because it does that feels like a, there's a logic to it, but it also feels like something that a lot of people have missed and they're kind of almost hypnotized by the the lower funnel. If they can steal money from brand and put it in there, they'll somehow increase that, the size of that market. Do, do you do you see that um, you know, out in market? Because it does feel like, and that there's certainly a lot of discussion about the fact that, that the, the bottom of the funnel, because you can see its relationship to the transaction has kind of captured a disproportionate share to the point where it almost deforms some companies. Like when you're observing the broader market, do you sense that? It depends on a company's access to metrics. So if you have a well-formed econometric model, it can tell you the impact of your brand spend versus your lower funnel spend. If you don't have that, then all you can see is your promotional spend and the benefits. You can't, you can't well attribute the brand spend. So I think in a business like that, you need a belief that brand is the right way to spend money. And, and we all know that traditionally we say 60, 40, 60 brand, 40 lower funnel is textbook how you should spend this stuff. Does that still hold for you? Um, at Spark, we're more, we'll be close. We're, our target is closer to 50, 50 yeah. than 60, 40. I think for me in our business, that makes more sense. I think it differs by industry, but there is a, there is a tension there and it's a healthy tension, I think. And I think the other, the other thing people, or at Spark, we're very focused on engagement. We'll probably come onto this with the game arena stuff, but just buying eyeballs through TV isn't isn't our approach to brand. We look for what's something we could do that can engage New Zealand at scale, that has a connection to our business, but also if we wanted to, could turn into a kind of a TV campaign. But But we don't start necessarily with a TV script. And then try and find some connection to the business. Well, I think I think it's the wrong way to do it, right? And and that because that feels quite evolutionary can, compared to what the the kind of classic brand ad, which was the thing unto itself. Now that is almost, if I'm understanding you correctly, that's you you will deploy that in the service of explaining something that you're doing somewhere else. That's a lot more kind of tactile and tangible for the customer. Yeah. So if you look at the launch of our Hello Tomorrow campaign. Must be about a year ago now. I'm not sure if you saw that, but that was a move from our brand position in Little Can Be Huge to Hello Tomorrow, which was designed to be a broader position, which we work across consumer, small business, and enterprise. Mm. Now, we launched the consumer element of that with a competition and using TikTok's duets functionality, where, you know, top New Zealand hip hop artist, she sang a verse, you sang a verse, and competed to get studio time. So, yes, it was about creating the future, using technology to create the future for some New Zealanders. And and Spark is a platform for New Zealand to have opportunities that wouldn't usually have. So that was what the whole Hello Tomorrow positioning is about. We got 17 million, you know, views on TikTok, right? So that's before we've done a TV ad, mm. you know? And so I think, so then when you do the TV ad, you're punching over the top of that already engaged audience. And was that construct, because th that's the, the ad that had a kind of a UGC feel or, or where yeah. it's kind of so spooked up. Yeah, the young woman that was singing in it, we, we found, she, you know, she was a young singer that we found for the spot. Uh, so we actually, you know, we made her famous in the, in the process as well. So we, it was all designed to go, yes, it's about Spark bringing the future to New Zealand and, and lifting its head and saying, you know what, we're about the future, but also the campaign actually enabled people's futures. So the idea that you're not just, you're actually doing something, you're not just talking about it, it's important to us. So just reversing track a bit to, to when you first started with Spark, 
you arrived just towards the tail end of Simon Mudo's long and, and largely acclaimed kind of uh, run as CEO there. And there were two sort of big properties, which I think were both still um, active at the time in Lightbox and, and Spark Sport, representing a big play into that area. Uh, not long after you start, uh, Jolie takes over and those things are, are ultimately exited. What what do you think the sort of learning from those you know, huge investments was from Spark's perspective in terms of what its role is within um, New Zealand and, and uh, technology consumer, all the things that overlapped with, with those projects? Yes, yeah, so I think for me, those were really interesting projects because they they were bets that, that, that Spark put down on businesses or capabilities that would engage New Zealanders beyond the core telco products and services that we, we already provided. Now, there's, there's two ways to look at that. One is, the from my perspective, the brand benefit. So something like Spark Sport being in the news every week, that's great from a brand perspective, right? You're out there, you're in front of people, you're providing a, a world-class service to quite a large proportion of, of New Zealand. Um, so that had a brand benefit. The Lightbox one was much more around we knew that when we have partnerships with people like Spotify and Netflix, that that drives loyalty for our base. And so how could we extend that with our own products and services, I guess? So, but, but a lot changed since the launch of something like Lightbox and when we exited it in terms of the, the global nature of that business and the increase in things like churn. So if you're churning 30% of a base you're replacing your whole customer base every three years. Like those sort of sort of dynamics don't was it Was that the kind of trend you were looking at with light, Lightbox? That wasn't the Lightbox one. That was just an example. I can't yeah. remember off the top of my head. But, that you know, a lot of these these VOD platforms have between 10 and 30% churn. Yeah, outside and, and of Netflix. So it's very, very common. Netflix, a little bit Disney, but they, yeah. they are very, um, they're, which means a lot of marketing spend, um, which can kind of chew into margin, right? Was that ultimately what sort of, pushed you towards the the you know the sale of that to Spark. When you look at the economics of that more broadly, you go the benefit to Spark was 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 more around the churn benefit yeah. um, than the standalone business value. And so as an enterprise, it doesn't make sense to then hold on to those things. Now what we do hold on to is things like our Spotify and Netflix relationships, because those are the number the number one in their category globally. And so, you know, we still make sure we have those, but, but it wasn't as important to own our own our own channels. So let, let's talk about the the Spotify and Netflix relationship. So how do they, you know, how are they sort of manifested, and what is the the function of them to you? Because there, there's they're obviously, I guess, they make your whole of customer relationship sort of thicker and stickier in some respects. Yeah, again, it comes back to brand. So as a brand, we're quite very focused on entertainment as a position, right? So we have the arena, we have a lot of uh, music relationships with um, artists and labels and festivals and things. Uh, then we have also Spotify um, and we have Netflix. And so for us, that's important because it starts to give people a perception of what Spark brings to the country beyond Telco, right? And so what I love about this, this Spotify Netflix story is we, we brought those products to New Zealand quite early um, and we distributed them. We, we did the marketing for them. We essentially, you know, with the distribution channels for those products in New Zealand. And that gives us um, a position beyond Taco, right, which is very much entertainment. So we're out of sport now. We don't focus on sport. We focus on music, um, video on demand, and and more broadly, entertainment, things like gaming. So the, that's kind of why those are the right partners for us. And at a brand level, we'll talk about the entertainment we do, but then when you get down to walk into a store, you're enabled because when you buy a phone or a line, you can get Spotify included. So it kind of ties the kind of the brand entertainment positioning with uh, when you walk in the store, there's an entertainment product as well. The irony is that when when you're in sports rights, uh, in sports, sorry, and in part because you were in sports, sports rights were more expensive, both zero interest rates and, and the fact that there was now two people bidding rather than one. They have come back now to the point where TVNZ, which is pretty challenged itself, you know, just picked up the breakers, for example. Is there a world where either in a, you know, a partnership like the uh, Spotify or Netflix one, or even in a sort of more, you know, potentially partnering with a, a, a league or a team that you might 
get back into that because the sports, the the live, the the data hungry, the the technology element is only increasing. And even though Spark Sports as a model was probably too costly ultimately to to be maintained, it still feels like there's something there in the that connects to to Spark uh, in a similar way to what Netflix and Spotify do in in other respects. Yeah, a focus is quite important to us. So I think you could say, yeah, we're going to do a bit of sport, a bit of gaming, a bit of music. A bit. I think you can spread yourself too thin as a brand. And right. there's a lot of businesses and brands doing sport out there. We're more focused on entertainment. People spend much more time streaming music through their, you know, their devices, streaming gaming through their devices, than they do streaming sport. So for us, we focus on the biggest opportunity, which for us is entertainment. So thinking about that idea of what a, what a, what of how Spark shows up for its customer, because you know, if we go back, you know, twenty years, it was was essentially a, a telco and and not a lot more. It made a very good strategic exit of Yellow, for example. Um, but there's a once you become Spark, you start to kind of reimagine what what the business is. Do you how mature do you feel like the company is in in that process? Because um, it still can feel from the outside like it's feeling out, it's feeling its way into into under, having a, a good mature understanding of what it what its role is beyond um, the telco. I think that's true of all telcos globally, probably. It is right? true. It, it's absolutely um, like you see the experiments, so yeah. you can that they they line up. Yeah. So I think what we're what we're seeing is that. The bets that we've placed so far um, around, you know, mobile entertainment for our consumer business are the right ones. When we look at our enterprise business, you know, similarly, we've put a lot of um, investment in the past years into things like our, our cloud infrastructure businesses like Curious, which focus on AI and analytics over the top of that. Mm. So again, I think if you look across the broader business, um, to your point, we've done some experimentation in some areas and then we've said, right, that's not working, drop that, move forward. But we've, by and large, the decisions we've made have stood us in quite good stead for what's what's coming, um, and so we, I, I don't see from a brand and marketing perspective a big change from where we currently are, are focused. Are you curious about how business can be better? I'm Simon Pound, and I host Business is Boring, a podcast where I caught it all with some of the most interesting people in entrepreneurship, commerce, and making things happen. Tune in to Business is Boring every Tuesday, brought to you by the Spinoff Podcast Network in partnership with Spark Business Lab. Kia ora, this is Toby Manhire, here to urge you to tune in to Gone by Lunchtime, a podcast with me, Annabelle Lee Mather and Ben Thomas, tackling the world of New Zealand politics, from policy to polling, from scandal to psychodrama. Listen to Gone by Lunchtime, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network, wherever good pods are sold. In terms of that sort of AI B2B space, I, I went along to the event last year where, where you sort of, sort of showed off what, what it could be. Might have been earlier this year, actually. I'm <laughs> starting to show my age, but there was there was a sense that Spark kind of saw its role as helping businesses access generative AI across a bunch of different domains, and and, and you've seen that in you know the the sort of section uh, mini MBA course, for example. Can you talk to me about essentially what the function of that is and how it's tracking for Spark from a business perspective? Yeah, so. We've spent a lot of effort and investment the last four years on our own business, getting ready for and applying AI um, capabilities to the, our own operations. That's in two ways. One is predictive analytics. So how do we use it to serve customers better so I can predict what you need before you need it, show up with the right thing at the right time. That's kind of the, the marketing dream, right? <clears throat> and so we've been working hard on how we how we use AI for our, for our customers. And then generative AI has come along, and that's actually the first use is Use cases for that are more internally, if you like. So, in our call centers and our HR teams, and but we've had also early access to that capability, and we've had teams that could get started quickly. So, when we started thinking about how we took the new brand position into the enterprise space, it was clear that if our ambition is to help New Zealand accelerate forward, then the idea that if you could move the whole country one technology generation forward was kind of what inspired us to go after this AI piece because this will have the biggest impact on the you know, efficiency of New Zealand businesses in the next five years or so. And so 
we then thought, what's the, what's the best way to do that? And, and to your point, rather than just talk about it, we wanted to actually do something material to help New Zealand businesses. So partnering with Section, which is a US-based MBA school, to bring their AI courses to New Zealand for New Zealand execs has been a, a core part of that. And now on the back of that, we also are working with um, our customers to identify what's the initial use cases or proof of value in their businesses, which we could then help them to, to build out prototypes for. So that's how we go from inspiring people, starting to give them, um, engaging them around what's possible, and then enabling through businesses like Curious and Spark, the ability for those, those partners of ours to also go on the same journey. Is there an external partner or, or a business that you've worked with that feels like a little prototype for what this could kind of grow into at a more macro level? Well, I think not really. What what we want to do is, so depending on the scale of the businesses we work with, right, so at an enterprise level, we provide cloud infrastructure for large New Zealand businesses and we help accelerate their ability to use that infrastructure to deliver value, right? So whether that's through a, a call center or marketing or whichever area. Then for smaller businesses, it's slightly different, right? So a large number of small businesses we deal with, mm. that's more of an education process, right? It's harder for us to be hands-on with them. But we've been doing this at scale with businesses around cloud for many years now, so it's not new to us. I think the AI piece is the stuff that's coming in at, at pace. So um, let's talk about Spark Game Arena, this this big event which uh, happened a couple of weeks ago as, as we record. T- tell me what what it was about gaming as a, as a sort of sector that um, made you think, you know, uh, it was worth baking, placing a big bet on. So two weeks ago, we launched Spark Game Arena Live. This journey happened, started 18 months ago, right? It's where we were looking at, as a brand, yeah, we're into entertainment, we're into music. Gaming's huge. It's 10 times the size of music and growing faster uh, at an industry level. From the research we've seen, you know, around 80% of New Zealand households are engaged in gaming in some way, shape, or form. And I heard the other day that the average gamer is a 32-year-old woman in New Zealand, which also is pretty cool, right? Because more... It, it Sounds like cliches doesn't always, gaming. It doesn't always feel that way, right? No. Um, and so... And then the, the, then the kicker is, to game, you need to connectivity. You need a broadband or a mobile connection. And a mobile phone is the biggest um, gaming device globally, right? So, <laughs> so you sit there and go, well... That feels like the obvious next thing for Spark to get involved with. Now, because, as I said before, we focus then on if we're going to get into gaming, how do we do it in a way that's authentic, that actually elevates the experience for gamers in New Zealand as a starting point. And then if we wanted to then go and do bigger things as a brand, we've got kind of the foundations for that and the credibility around it. And and we've got the... To my Nike example, we've got the influencers and the right people on board already. That's that's very much what Game Arena Live was about. Is how do we how do we start this? Now we we ran some tournaments, Fortnite tournaments, smaller ones in preparation for this, just to get a feel for how it worked to make sure we had the capability internally. But yeah, so then Spark Game Arena Live was our first kind of big foray into into this particular part of entertainment. It was a, and it's a huge foray. I went along on um, the Saturday morning and the level of production, the way that Spark Arena was used and, yeah, just you, it was clearly like a, a really big swing. Yeah, just to, to give me your impressions of how the first one went and, you know, what you thought went well and, and what you think you'll sort of learn from when if you, uh, you know, return to it in a year's time. Yeah, so... When you're doing, you're, it's always really scary doing the first one, right? Terrifying, <laughs> terrifying. Because as you say, if you're going to do it, it needs to be remarkable because if it's unremarkable, no one will talk about it. And because you can't have hundreds of thousands of people at these events, you need it to be talkable and you need to have people there who are broadcasting outside of the venue, everything that's going on. You also need enough people that it feels busy. <laughs> and so I think... It was two sessions, and the morning session was largely families. I think you would have seen if you were there. Yep. And it, it was it wasn't sold out, but it was busy enough. I will, I was wondering whether we would want it any busier because every single station was had queues. That right? was the and thing. So, there was both a lot of space, but also very hard every, to get yeah, on a machine. Yeah, yeah. So I think it was it was a great learning to go. <clears throat> if we were going to pack it out even more next time, we'd probably need a slightly different approach to moving people through moving people probably, around. Yeah. So it was actually perfect in the morning. To get a feel for for that and for everyone to have a good time and not the queues be 
be too long. Um, and I, I'm not sure if you saw the live Fortnite finals, but I hadn't seen one before and it was a pretty incredible experience. It was, was really, really interesting to watch. Also just massively cute seeing all these teenagers on a big stage, yeah. just, you know, like it was a, a, a very different kind of sporting event in that regard. Yeah, and the power of influences. So you, for people that were there, if you're walking around, there was queues for every single kind of stand, if you want, or 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 game that you could play. But the biggest by far queue was for the to get a photo with one of the influencers who were there, right? Which, again, just shows this is starting to surface that these people, you know, they've got millions and millions of followers. Mm. Um, and they're superstars in their own right, but they're not necessarily recognised as that through traditional media channels. The thing that's interesting to me is that why did Spark do it itself? Is that because there just isn't really the... Because with music, for example, you can partner with a bunch of pre-existing festivals, promoters, there's, you know, from the multinational to the sort of more boutique. With gaming, there just isn't really anything like this. So was that what prompted you to kind of have to place the, the, the big bet yourselves? Yeah, so partly that and partly there's a credibility element to it, right? If you just If you just badge something else, you're kind of late to the party you're just piggybacking on someone else's thing. And actually, there's room to partner more prolifically in, in the future. But for us, it was actually quite important to go, Spark's not coming in just trying to badge other people's stuff. We actually think there's an opportunity to elevate how New Zealand sees and does this. And that was part, partly by how we saw our role in this, to, to, to show what's possible and to set the scene for the future. Do you, because that, that sort of badging exercise thing is another sort of, I guess, trope you hear within marketing. Do you think that you know that moving towards a more sort of vertical you know do-it-yourself approach versus partnering with organizations is that the future or, or was it there was something unique to gaming that said with this thing we have to to approach it that way ourselves it, it was we saw it as the way to get it started right so it's not our usual approach right because things like music there's lots of big established New Zealand players and therefore your partner. But at least to get this kicked off, we felt like there's an opportunity to do it ourselves. And then as we go forward, obviously we can broaden our partnerships and, and take it from there. How does it look from a sort of a cost benefit basis? Because obviously one of the things with doing it yourself is you start to assume some of the, the risks and investment profiles of a promoter versus the much more knowable, you know, if you're partnering with a you know, Rhythm and Vines or an Auckland City Limits, it's, it's this package and you can do this thing there. Yeah, and that's where there's a different level of investment because it's more like making a TV ad, right? So for the price of a TV ad, you're doing an event. Mm. And what you get then is weeks and weeks of run up to the event. Everyone says Spark's doing this thing. Then you have the event itself, which has huge reach on the day. And then there's weeks after that where you, you have content going out. So it's an earned media approach versus a more traditional TV approach. How, how will this add up versus a TV ad? Can't tell you yet. Maybe I've come back in a in a few months and, and give you an update on that. But that's that's why we think about it. as engagement's the metric. We'll have huge reach across all the social channels on this, um, and each of our brand activities hits a slightly different audience, right? So if you're on TV, you're probably skewing slightly older, slightly different messaging. Um, if you're through social channels on music, music it's broader, um, and then and then gaming again is super broad, but parents will probably hear about it from their kids rather than the other way around, right? So you have to kind of, through the year, balance balance out your investment to make sure you hit your key audiences and get the mix right. Quint, just thought we'd run on a while then, but that sort of brings up something which I'd, uh, might be quite good to close on is, you know, because you're a very data-driven person um, and Spark is a very data-driven organization, I, I feel like your perspective on this will be quite interesting. We live in such an atomized um, and kind of complex media market and era. Um, and, you know, one of the surveys that I'm, I always find interesting is an attempt to kind of try and balance it as New Zealand on Air is where are the audiences. Is that something you pay attention to? Or if not, what are the ways that you try and get a, a sort of a global view of how New Zealanders are using different types of media and, and kind of how, therefore, how Spark should sort of play in different areas? I think that it's, it's hard when you look at those studies which try and cover every different media channel because I think like how is TV viewership is still measured in 15 minute increments or something 
Yeah, I I, 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 they, they they have the sort of the reach and the the sort of an average rating. But yeah, you, you're right. I mean that that touches on how you compare sort of apples with yeah. apples with asteroids. You yeah, know? so th- this I think I think it comes back. It's different for different brands to different audiences. For us, I'll always come back to engagement is our key metric. If people aren't engaging after they see an ad or do something, then it hasn't worked, right? And engagement's much more powerful than someone just listening to something while an ad breaks on. So I think for us, we look at which mix of channels generates the best engagement, and TV and radio have a, and outdoor have a role to play there, but that will vary by the type of audience we're after and the type of um, outcome we're looking for. And so I don't think there's an average. I think that we very much, very much, and we'll also risk, say, 10% to experiment on new stuff. Because that's the only way you find out for your own brand. But yeah, I, I, I take those kind of average reports with a bit of a grain of salt. I read them and then go, is there anything in here which I think we might be missing? But really we focus on what's working for our own audiences and which channels work for us to generate the outcomes we're looking for. Well, um, yeah, it's a, it's a complex job, but um, thanks so much for coming on The Fold today and just sort of talking through the the, the complexity and the thinking that, that goes behind Spark's approach. Yeah, really appreciate hey, thanks it. Thanks for having me. Kia ora e te iwi, te Aihe Butler here, podcast manager at The Spin-Off. If you enjoy listening to our podcasts, consider supporting our mahi by signing up to become a Spin-Off member at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. Do you find it hard staying optimistic with all the financial news in the media? I'm Bernard Hickey, and on my podcast, When the Facts Change, I'm here to help you navigate the ever-changing landscape of economics in Aotearoa. So join the conversation every Friday on When the Facts Change, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network in partnership with KiwiBank. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.